Hello everyone. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to watch this presentation on pavement ride quality and IRI specifications for state aid programs. My name is Thomas Glaufelter. I'm a senior engineer and I work for the New Jersey Department of Transportation, Division of Local Aid and Economic Development, and I'll be teaching you today. In this presentation, we'll go over seven parts. What is IRI? Why is IRI important? Why are we required to measure IRI? Where is IRI required? How do we calculate IRI pay adjustments? Best management practices? And a conclusion. So, on to part one. What is IRI? Why is IRI important? IRI stands for International Roughness Index. It's a measurement of roadway smoothness, or it can also be expressed as a longitudinal profile of the roadway. IRI is important because it affects ride quality, fuel consumption, maintenance costs, and vehicle delay costs. So it's integrated into a lot of cost savings for both roadway owners and roadway users. And what must be stressed is numerous studies have shown that roadway users will judge pavement primarily by roadway smoothness. So IRI is the most important factor in creating satisfied roadway users. Smoother roads also tend to last longer. They stay smoother for longer and they're safer. To the right of the slide, you'll see a study that shows just how much the performance life of pavement can be improved by reductions to roughness. You can see from a reduction of roughness of 10%, the performance life of pavement can be extended anywhere from three to 11%. Reduction of, in roughness of 25% can give you a performance life extended anywhere from 9 to 28% of the roadway. And a reduction of roughness of 50% can extend the performance life anywhere from 18% to 55%. So it is a fantastic investment all around to invest in smooth roadways. Now, why are we required to measure IRI? Congress passed the mandate requiring a biennial report be provided from every state DOT. And you can find the requirements for that in the Code of Federal Regulations, 23 CFR Part 490. Now that we know why, where is IRI required? On the right side of this slide, you'll see a map of New Jersey highlighting the National Highway System or NHS. Any NHS roadway or NJDOT jurisdiction roadway is required to have IRI measurements and performance standards applied to it. Now you'll see later on in this presentation that when designing, it's important to know what the pre-construction or current average IRI is. And for that, since we take that data every two years, you can actually request that from the DOT. Simon Muchukwu is currently our contact for that information, and you can contact him at the email address listed on this slide to request any IRI information on any roadway where it's kept. Now we know where, how is IRI measured? IRI is measured using road surface profilers, and here we'll go over some of the technologies integrated into that. The first is a height sensor. This uses lasers to measure the distance from the vehicle to the roadway. The next is an accelerometer. This can measure acceleration to figure out the orientation of an object. This is the same type of technology used in smartphones that can identify whether or not your phone is held sideways or upside down. These technologies will let us figure out the profile elevation to help fill out our longitudinal profile. And the final piece of data that we need from the roadway itself as the vehicle tests is the distance and speed that is traveling. Then that is all brought together to one final piece of equipment, a computer with software that can interpret and understand all the information gathered from this hardware. As a part of New Jersey's Transportation Asset Management Plan, there's a few vehicles that we use to perform these tests. And I'm gonna go over a few of them with you. This is Pathway Service Inc.'s Path Runner vehicle. As you can see, it does a whole lot more than IRI, but we're just gonna focus on IRI for right now. You can see at the front of the vehicle is a class one inertial road profiler. You can see it's located close to the ground. 
you can see it's located in the very front. At the bottom left corner of this slide, near the passenger side rear tire, you can see the distance measurement instrument. This is the height sensor measurement system or the profiler. From here, you can see exactly where it is on the vehicle. You can see it's very low to the ground. You can see it's right in front. These can take up to 3,500 measurements per second with precisions up to hundredths of a millimeter. And it's very important that this is done in the wheel path itself. With this close up, you can see its relation to the tires of the vehicle. This is important because these vehicles need to pick up the information in the wheel path themselves. This is Advanced Infrastructure Design's integrated testing vehicle. And again, it picks up many forms of information, but we're interested in IRI. Again, you can see at the bottom right of that screen is the profiler itself, again, in line with, with the wheels. And you can see on the real wheel, on the passenger side, the distance measurement instrument. This is Surface System and Instruments Portable Profiler. This you can see from the bottom up, you can see just how well in line it is with the tires of the vehicle to pick up IRI. This is the block test. This ensures that the height sensors are working correctly. You can see the laser going onto a block. This is done on a flat surface. Every dimension of that block is known and this will help ensure that it's functioning correctly whenever the vehicle needs to go out and test for IRI. This is the detail of it. You can see the laser coming out of the profiler. It's bouncing off of the block. It's being picked up by a lens and directed into a position detector. Now that we know that the height measurements are correct, what about the accelerometer? So to do that, we employ a bounce test. And again, the vehicle is kept motionless, flat surface, and a signal is sent through all of the equipment to simulate roadway speeds that we would be collecting data from. From here, this is called a static test, no movement. What's it picking up? Then a vertical displacement of two inches or more is introduced, or a dynamic bounce, as you could call it. And you can see the results of it there. This vehicle passed and the accelerometer is working perfectly. The next point of our presentation is how do we calculate IRI pay adjustments? We've broken this down into a five-step procedure based on when that information becomes available over the life of project. This is our recommended way of doing it. And you can find these procedures in subsection 401.03.07.j of the special provisions for state aid projects. After we go through all of these, we'll do an example to give you a better idea of what this looks like. So step one is information from the design phase. We need to know what type of roadway this is. We can need to know how many lots are gonna be in our project. We need to know what the pre-construction or current average IRI of the roadway is. We know how many operations the project will undergo. And we also need to know the design thickness of the last lift. Once we have that information, we can move on to step two, which is finding your target IRI. This table is taken out of the special provisions and you start from the left column and you move right. So first you would start with what your roadway type is. Is it NHS? Is it a freeway? What's the speed limit? Is it a local roadway? Then from there you move to the next column to the right. We look at current average IRI. If that doesn't exist because this is a new construction, you would skip that column and move to the third column. This is because the target IRI will be dependent on what the current IRI is. So if you have a current average IRI, you would go through all the columns there to see where it fits. Then from there, you would move again, skipping the column for new construction and head over to operations. So operations are defined as a milling, it is one operation, every lift of pavement you put, that's another operation. So depending on how many operations you can do, a better target IRI can be achieved. These are the target IRI notes. There's a lot here, but we won't go over all of them. But to keep in mind, when we talk about courage average IRI, if you have different speed limits, we have an equation to figure that out for you. If you're paving over rebelized concrete, if you're paving over any form of concrete that is an HMA, 
These are all factors you're gonna to wanna to know. And they come up in the notes. So just be mindful when you're designing that your target is gonna be affected by these factors. Step three, information about the project from the bid and award. This is important because we need some bid prices. We need to know the bid price of milling per square yard, as well as the bid price of the last lift of the pavement structure to be evaluated per ton. Now bid prices can be a bit tricky at times. They can fluctuate. So to make sure our equation always puts out expected value and always functions, there's a minimum value that we must look at for the last lift of the pavement structure. This is determined by what type of asphalt you're putting down as well as the binder. A few definitions that we need to, to move on to the next step. We need to find what exactly is the final riding surface. That's just going to be where traffic is driving. The current average IRI is the pre-construction average IRI of no more than two years from the start of the project. And again, you can request that from the DOT as we discussed earlier. Lot sizes are one one hundredth of a mile per lane. Again, measured in inches per mile. And it is the duty of the RE and the LPA to designate an independent testing agency to perform the IRI testing. Now on step four, now that all that testing is done, we can find our pay adjustment equation for the lot we're testing. So again, this table is from the special provisions and you move from left column to right column. You look at your pay equation to type and your pay equation type is determined by whether or not this is NHS, whether it's a main line, whether it's a shoulder, whether it's over a bridge. And then you move to the next column, exclusions. If you have no exclusions, you move to the next column, which is a comparison of the post-construction IRI to the target IRI. And then once you find where that settles, you move one column over to the pay equation. The final step, step five, will be evaluating the pay equation that you were just given. This could potentially use all the factors we just talked about. It can be a very complex thing, but we're gonna go through an example and I'll show you how all that pans out. This is an example, a hypothetical project. What if we're resurfacing an NHS freeway for one mile for two lanes, mill of two inches and resurface for two inches in two lifts of one inch each? Now we move to step one. What information can we get from the design phase? Well, we know what type of roadway it is. We know how many lots they're going to be. We know that the lot is one one hundredth of a mile per lane. We know we have one mile divided by one one hundredth of a mile per lot per lane gives us a hundred lots per lane. And we know that we, there's going to be two lanes. So two lanes times a hundred lots per lane give us 200 lots total. Now, what is the pre-construction IRI? For this example, we'll say it's 50 inches per mile. How many operations will the project undergo? Milling is one operation. Each lift is one operation. That gives us one mill plus two lifts for a total of three. What is the design thickness of the last lift? We define that to be one inch. Now we move on to the next step and find the target IRI. So we start left and work our way to the right. What's our roadway type? We define it as an NHS freeway. So we start all the way at the top. Then we need to know what our current average IRI was. We define that as 50. So we compare it to all the columns there and we see that it fits in the below 60 category. This isn't a, going to be any form of new construction. So we're not gonna look there. We know that it's gonna be three operations. It won't be one operation. It won't be two operations, but three. And that 50 there, that is our target IRI. Step three, we need information about the project from the bid and award. So now the, our hypothetical project has been bid, and now we know that the price of milling is $10 per square yard, and we know the bid price of the pavement is $80 per ton. Now we have to check that bid price of the pavement to our table for minimum values. And let's just say it's HMA with a binder PG64-22, and we see that the minimum value is 60. 80 is above 60, so we've met the minimum threshold, and we'll be using 80 for our calculation. Step four, everything's been built. The independent testing agency has given us our IRI value, and they've told us it is 60 inches per mile. 
Now with this information, we can pick out our pay adjustment equation. So again, we start left and we work our way to the right. We define this as an NHS roadway and we're on a travel lane. So we'll be using PA1. This lot will not be excluded for the sake of this example. And now we need to compare our target and our post-construction IRI. Our target was 50 inches per mile. What we got was 60 inches per mile. So we know it's not the top, which is where the post-construction IRI is less than target. Now we go to the middle one, which shows that the target IRI is less than what we got, which is true. And our post-construction IRI is less than 170. That fits our example, so that's the one we're gonna use. Now we just move one column to the right, and we can see what we're gonna do for pay adjustment. We're going to use the PAE equation. Now comes step five, we had to evaluate all of this. As part of the PAE, you'll see that the first variable is A, and A is defined using all of the information that we had just gathered from every step. So we need design thickness of the last lift, we need the price of milling per square yard, and we need the price of the final lift of the paving structure to be evaluated per ton. After we plug that all in, we get a value of A for $2,083.84. Now that that's evaluated, we can plug it into the PAE equation. And evaluating that gives us a final pay adjustment for IRI for this singular lot that was only 10 inches per mile off the target IRI. And we see it's negative $7.55. Now, of course, there are exclusions. There are many different things that could affect the IRI in an adverse way. So we have an exclusions document. This is maintained by the Pavement and Drainage Management and Technology Unit at the URL posted here. And we'll do a quick run through of what some of those are. Any impediments, anything metal, a metal object in the roadway, could be a manhole, could be an inlet, vent, anything. That can cause the lot to be excluded. Anywhere where there are intersections, we call these short sections. A manhole could be in front of it. The shoulder might be too large. You can see on here whether or not that is excluded. Again, there could be something in the middle of that roadway that's intersecting. All of these are things that could potentially be exclusions. Jug handles, U-turns, railroad crossings, any type of intersection that goes through the freeway or the NJGOT jurisdiction roadway could count as an exclusion for that lot. Anything on bridges, depending on the approach, depending on what the bridge is paved with, concrete or asphalt, could potentially be an exclusion. Table 401.3.07-7A is a table that's in the special provisions, which will be a part of the bid documents. This denotes where exclusions are going to be on the project. This will be filled in by the designer, and we've had a few questions about this, so I just want to highlight how to fill out this table. You put in the name of the roadway, for instance, Route 95 northbound or southbound. You put in the lane number, where the exclusions are, say lane one, two, and you write how many exclusions are gonna be in that lane. Could be four, six, one, two, but this is how this table should look. Now we'll discuss a few best management practices when it comes to all these processes for LPAs that might not be familiar with us. So just to start, these IRI targets are very achievable. The existing conditions will have a very minor effect on what the IRI is post-construction. The biggest effect that will, will determine what your IRI is on your roadways are construction practices and how it was paved. So coordination is key. Smooth, continuous operations are absolutely vital to a smooth roadway. Some things to keep in mind for construction record keeping is information about all the equipment, the milling machine, how fast was it going? Was it cleaned? The paver, was it continuously putting out pavement? How fast was it going? How about the temperature of the pavement? Are the rollers keeping up? Did they have a plan for this? They have a paving plan they provided you prior to the project starting. And of course, record if any quality control is being done by the contractor themselves, you should have that information. Some lessons that the DOT has learned from keeping track of our roadways is collect video during the daytime. You do not need to close the roadways. You can collect IRI at posted speeds. 
The vehicles need a minimum of 16 miles per hour and they can go anywhere up on highway speeds. Up to 65 miles per hour is no problem to collect IRI. Always request calibration charts for the equipment that the contractor is using. Make sure to clearly mark the paving limits from beginning to end with a white tape. And as a part of our IRI requirements, the independent testing agency should be using a retroflective tape that will let the vehicle know where IRI starts and stops. So you should always see a tape out there delineating where the project starts and stops any limits. And of course, most importantly, plan and perform a continuous operation, minimize stops and starts. The best you can do is no stops. Always minimize it. We'll move on to the conclusion. Always remember to check for updates for any local aid forms, or any updates to the special provisions for state aid projects. And you can find that at the Local Aid Resource Center at the URL posted above. If you have any questions about this, you can always contact your district local aid office with any questions you may have. And we have a map showing all the districts there. And this is contact information for the Local Aid Resource Center itself. You can always email or call up and we'll have someone who can talk to you directly at any time. Thank you so much for taking the time to come and watch this presentation. Again, my name is Thomas Gladfelter and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.